Thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks to the FDA and uh, Duke Margulies for putting this together. Um, I'm very encouraged by this meeting. I, in a break, Val Jensen and I were talking. This is probably the tenth year I've sat on a panel like this, um, and have heard the same thing year after year after year, and we're back here again. The difference for me is this is the engine behind this is the FDA, and so I really think we now have the opportunity to get where we need to get to. That said. I think an important fact that we need to understand is that this is a multi-stakeholder issue. It's not one issue, FDA or the manufacturers or the GPOs or whatever it is. From the beginning of a product, whether it's the development of the product, the approval of the product, the manufacturing and, and, a, and release of the product, the distribution, uh, going to the pharmacy, dispensing, and finally to the patient, all of that is an issue that raises different points throughout the process. And if we don't all get together, we're not gonna solve this. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, but with that said, and I have listened very closely today with some things that were raised, uh, and so some recommendations, I guess, that I would put forward for uh, people to consider. Transparency and communication is absolutely important. Um, I might have a little bit different opinion on why it really matters where the manufacturing site is, but that's, everybody has an opinion, but trans, Transparency and communications is very important between the manufacturers and the FDA. If we don't have a heads up clue of when our approvals are going to occur or when our PAS process is going to be approved, we can't go into the manufacturing stream to do that. And those manufacturing streams, especially in the sterile generic injectable, is usually somewhere four to six months at the very least and more like six to nine months to make that happen. So if you don't have that heads up, the day you get notified, you're months and months away from actually making product and getting it onto the market. So I think it's very important to do that. Uh, FDA should also further enhance and improve the existing expedited resolution pathway. We heard earlier today about prior approval supplements versus CBE 30. If we could get to a place where we could agree in a drug shortage situation that a CBE 30 could work, at least in that situation, to get the product to market, that would help significantly. You know, you look at drug shortage when it goes completely into drug shortage, there is no other option. We do go external, external to the United States, and import products in. Those products are not fully approved by the FDA through the review process. They do go in and inspect the facilities, and they do meet safety needs. That's an important fact but it's almost like a CBE 30 process, if you will. So if we can do that when we're importing, why aren't we doing that for our products here? New and updated guidances. So the FDA uh, can and should continue to update guidances because standards in the, uh, both the brand and generic drugs change frequently. The issue is, is do we need to hold up an application because a guidance changed in the middle of that application? So if you have an, a guidance that's changed, excuse me, if you developed a product under one guidance, you submit it and a guidance changes because we find new information, holding that product up for review and approval because of that guidance change is not necessarily important as long as it's not safety and efficacy reasons that we made those changes. So if there are some other changes like uh, compendial or labeling or bioequivalence changes, those might be able to be handled and a post-market review. If I have two identical products, one is approved out in the market, one is going through the approval process, once that happens, the one that's being approved will be held up because of the guidance that has just changed into a draft form. The product that's on the market will stay on the market, won't be pulled off, but will have to go through a post-market review. So if we could look at something like that as an option that could help us get products in drug shortage to the market faster. New GMP requirements or enhancements to GMP requirements should be provided by, by a guidance rather than through 483s. So many times when the FDA makes a change in how they are doing their inspection process, it isn't a guidance change, it's, I'm gonna use the word state of the art change, which we don't disagree that those should be in place, but a lot of times one manufacturer doesn't learn about that change except that they saw 483 that another manufacturer got and they realize, oop, this is the new standard, I need to make an adjustment. But you don't know for sure that you need to make that adjustment until you get inspected and then it's too late at that point in time. So if we had look at putting those uh, item changes in a guidance, that would be very helpful. 
Um, CETA should meet uh, with a sponsor for a drug shortage product upon request. So once we have an inspection, for example, and we respond to the 483 with our response, which is required within 15 days, there should be a meeting that would occur so there could be a conversation, a communications and a transparency, if you will, between the manufacturer and the FDA to be able to move quickly through that process and then get a reinspection in place in a very short period of time. We addressed some of this in GADUFA too, but we didn't necessarily address all of it and, and we need to do that. We talked about manufacturing redundancy and why is there not manufacturing redundancy? We don't find that in the brand world and you don't find it in the generic world in either one, but in the generic world it's even a tighter perspective because of the finances that are in place. You can't have or it's, it's very difficult financially to have a manufacturing facility sitting idle waiting for what if. Oh, by the way, when you approve a drug, or the FDA, excuse me, approves a drug, they approve that drug on a specific manufacturing line. And every line you approve on, you have to run the, the, run the product, do the testing, and get it approved on multiple lines. In the generic world, we just can't afford to do that for multiple lines to sit idle. So we need to look at other opportunities and other options. Uh, one of those could be in having the HHS and FDA consider instituting a program that would provide targeted federal grants or contracts. So let the federal government help in the production of these facilities. Um, and then of course, as we need to move products from one line to another line, we would need the FDA to help with that process as well. That redundancy could help. And we did see some of this in the 21st century cures uh, along uh, continuous manufacturing. Contingency planning, uh, HHS and FDA could help develop a supply contingency plan. This would be along the lines of the Strategic National Stockpile Program that already exists today for some specific products, like products that are used against terror, uh, drugs, et cetera. So something like that, that we could have the critical drugs, and the FDA is talking about having a critical drug list. So on that critical drug list, we could have some of those products that are made ahead of time and, and stored, and the government would help with that process. Uh, market forces is, is another area that we need to look at and better understanding the role of purchasers. So we've heard already about the consolidation. If you look at, at the industry, so the FDA approved 1,000 applications last year, record number, or over 1,000, a record number of applications. Of those, and we reviewed this with our member companies, only about 50% actually made it to market. Why? Because there just wasn't a market to go to. When you have the wholesaler, distributor, and retailers combining to just three markets, that limits very much who can come to the market and the market dynamics. And some people say, well, the industry, generic industry is consolidating too. That's true, we are. But in last year's application, those thousand I was talking about, there were over 120 companies that that was the first time they had ever filed an application. So while there is some consolidation going on, there's a lot of new players coming into the market and we need to look at opportunities to bring them about. Um, so with that, and in conclusion, I would just say that it, it's very important, again, that we look at a process that pulls us all together and we work together to get this solution and we don't aim fingers at one another who's causing the problem. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, David. And